You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Central, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app, that's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. Quick Strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy to use web based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. Quick Strike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for TWIFO. This week in Futures Options, a program where pretty much as the name implies, you break down the week that wasn't in many cases still is from a futures options and indeed in this case also a futures today perspective my name is mark longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as of course from the ever exciting options insider radio network so happy to be back on twifo a little bit under the weather and i think by a little bit i mean a horrible amount under the weather last week so thankfully uh mr nick and uncle mike uh, stepping into the fray there and doing an admirable bang up job I don't that you guys don't need me. I can go off and do and do other things. You guys are you guys have but taking the show to the next level in my absence and I appreciate that. Of course, if you guys want to follow along live, you can do so a couple of different places. You can follow the live stream and get in the live chat there at Mixler. That's uh, mixler.com slash uh, is I think it's options hyphen insider, something along those lines. Uh, yeah, options hyphen insider. Just grab the link from all of our various social media accounts. If you've seen it once, set it and forget.
get it. If you want to know when we're live throughout the week, not just for this show, then uh, follow us in Mixler, and it'll tell you the second we go live. And, of course, if you want to follow along with the reports, cmegroup.com slash twifo, T-W-I-F-O. That's where you can get all the latest and greatest data that Nick and I will be talking about throughout the show. Speaking of Mr. Nick, my cohort, my partner in crime, last week's mega host extraordinaire, Let's bring him on to the show, Mr. Nick Howard, the founder of Bantix Technologies and creator of a little platform we like to use at least once or twice around here called Quick Strike. Mr. Nick, welcome back to the show, sir. Hey, uh, I was all prepared to uh, to host again. What's going on? Oh, you feel left down now, huh? You got, you got yeah. put in the big chair, and now you feel like you're back at the kids' table. Is that what it is? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of at a loss for words right now, but I'll do the best I can. I got to say, you lit it up last week, sir. You you kept the show flowing. You let Uncle Mike in when he needed to be. You tossed him at the right times. You got the listener questions in. It's like you've been paying attention on this radio thing or something. Well done. Well, I, I downloaded my uh, my uh, guide to podcasting from uh, Options Insider Education site. So that's I read that before the show. And, uh, <laughs> there we go. Our our network hosting guide. We probably should have one of those. It probably would be a handy thing. <laughs> would be a handy thing uh, to put together. But you know, there's a lot popping off today, Mister Nick. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen it, uh, but uh, Bitcoin taking a little bit on the chin. Uh, we got crude's been moving this week. Vol's been going all over the place. I'll let you pick since you're at the kids' table. Kids never feel like they have a place, so you can have any, any powers. You can choose this week, Mr. Nick. What do you, where do you want to start this week? Well, well, let's just go there and get it out of the way um, because it's, you know, it's funny that we'll talk about, let's talk Bitcoin because that seems to be what everybody wants to talk about. And, and uh, it's the first chart in, uh, in the notes today. So we could address that and, uh, and then move on to the stuff that, may likely outlive the Bitcoin, but for now is in the shadows of Bitcoin. Definitely. Uh, it definitely is. Uh, you're right. Uh, everyone's got Bitcoin on the brain. We are, of course, recording this and streaming it live at 1.30 p.m. Central here on Friday, the 22nd of December. So if you listen after the fact, listen, it's a day where uh, the Bitcoin futures have been taking it on the chin. Massive sell-off sparked yesterday and then continued into uh, today's session uh, pretty much depending on where you're looking, it's just been a, a bit of a bloodbath out there on all things uh, hashtag uh, Bitcoin. Of course, uh, the Bitcoin actually hit a, uh, a high just back on uh, Sunday of uh, what was the exact 19,800 uh, hit back on Sunday. And then this week it uh, moved in, shall we say, a different direction, fell nearly 50% throughout the course of the week uh, from peak to trough, uh, dropped about $9,400 uh, and uh, lost more than 1000 bucks just in an hour, uh, just this morning. Of course, a lot of people were looking to the futures to provide a little bit of a stability in this type of environment, and they did. In fact, I think we got someone in the chat, yeah, Option got asking, did CME go limit down today in Bitcoin? Yes, they did. Uh, the product was off pretty much about 20%, uh, which is where their their circuit breaker kicks in. It dropped to about, I think, 12 to 65, I believe, is where the CME uh, future was triggered. And, of course, we saw different moves on different platforms uh, throughout the day. That's one of the things about a fragmented ecosystem. You can see things moving uh, in different areas. But that little bit of a halt may be providing a little bit of, uh, of a respite for the people out there who, who certainly needed it. By middle of today's session, it seems like a, a lot of the bloodletting was, uh, was done. Uh, let's see, we had plunged as low as below, actually below 11,000 today at one point. Seems like it had recovered to 13, 13 one actually a little while ago. I haven't checked in in a few minutes to see if that's changed. But so it seems like at least the worst of the uh, of the of the bloodletting was uh, what is over in terms of uh, downside. I know uh, some of the venues out there outside of places like CME were having issues. Uh, Coinbase at 11 a.m. I think said they were actually halted in terms of just you couldn't do anything on there. Their platform was down uh, and they have about I don't think like 13 million users or something like that. So that didn't help uh, in terms of adding to uh, the confusion out there. In terms of volume, it's been a pretty active day, uh, as you might imagine, uh, looking at the CME numbers right now. And I remember the CME is the beefiest contract out there. The CME is five coins. So we all know, well, that value depends on what time you're looking at it today. But that's still a pretty meaty contract. And they've done over 2,000 just in the front month. And it looks like pushing... Uh, 
about oh, about 2300 2400 today across the uh, across the full spectrum they have four months listed jan feb march and june and uh, the lion's share there 20 almost 2100 going up in june which is pretty good volume multiply that times the five times a multiplier you're talking a pretty hefty volume it's pretty much in line that SIBO is doing about ten thousand or so which is pretty much in line when you factor in the multiplier so Busy day across the board for everybody who's looking at uh, Bitcoin futures. And of course, uh, people have been, this doesn't even take into account today's uh, activity, but this is a chart someone sent in from FT, I believe about a week or so or two ago, they put this together, looking at the actual realized annual, annualized, easy for me to say, realized annual vol of Bitcoin compared to other commodity contracts that I talk about a lot here on the show. Uh, and they had it at about an 80, looks like about an 85% here on this chart. It's hard to read the precise legend here where WTI realized annual is at about a 25 or so, corn just shy of 20, gold that looks like about a, about a 10 or so, and the S&P we know has been anemic from a realized perspective most of the year, shy of six. So it's in that five to six range there on the S&P. So that puts it in perspective. We've talked before about what some of the actual volatility of Bitcoin is. Of course, this week is going to add a little bit to that froth. So maybe the numbers looking back from next week when we incorporate this week's madness in will look a little bit different. But either way, when you're looking at pure commodity volatility, I mean, we've been saying for how long, and we'll get to it in a little bit about WTI. They keep squeezing the vol out of that sponge. Same thing for gold. If you're looking for commodity volatility, uh, reservations about the underlying aside, Bitcoin is certainly where that action has been. And if you want to know really quickly, Mr. Nick, uh, people send in us all kinds of data about this, and someone sent in a great chart. Touched on a little bit on vol views. I'll do a quick rundown of it here as well. Uh, just uh, how fast Bitcoin has actually been moving. It, it made the first move th zero to uh, past 1,000 in about about five years, a little around that number, and then hit 2,000 level, so added another 1,000 in about a little less than four years. Uh, hit the 3,000 level, 23 days. 4,000 level, 3,000 to 4,000, that is, in 62 days, 61 days to pass 5,000, 8 days to pass 6,000, 13 days to pass 7,000, uh, 14 days to pass 8,000, 9 days to pass 9,000, 2 days to hit the 10,000 level. I think we all remember that. That wasn't that long ago. And we went back down towards it almost again today. Uh, then 10 to 11,000 was a day. Uh, 12,000 to hit in 6 days. 17 hours to pass 13,000. 4 hours to pass 14,000, 10 hours for 15,000, uh, f a whopping five hours to hit the 16,000 level, two hours for 17,000, 10 minutes for 18, three minutes for 19. And then again, this chart stops out at 14,000. But of course, the big downside move of this week, it erased uh, from 19,666, that's where they have the high hair, uh, to about 14,000. Took four days, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nick. So been a crazy week. Uh, obviously, people I'm sure are hitting you up as they're hitting us, us up for data and have questions about the vol and everything else. So uh, what are your thoughts on this just uh, this Bitcoin palooza we're living in right now? Well, I mean, I, I don't think it's any different than anybody's been expecting. I, I, I mean, if you look at it, you know, 15,000 and it breaks uh, and it breaks a thousand, that's a 6% move, right? So if you had a $15 stock that broke a dollar, you know, you probably wouldn't think so much about it. But when you're talking about thousands, uh, it, it's a, it puts it puts a little bit uh, obvious larger number on it and people pay more attention to it there. Um, as far as as far as anything interesting, I just tweeted out uh, just so everybody knows we we are plotting the futures and the and the uh, uh, indexes out uh, on both our stuff. The futures are currently only in the subscription stuff and the essentials, and the uh, the index is out there on the Bitcoin tool on the CME Group website. So you can go out there and get the charts, uh, particularly around the futures, and then also on the index that the future is covering. So uh, take a look at that, and that's a nice resource for you to follow. Because, like Mark said, there's all kinds of different resources, all kinds of different prices, and we'll. We'll try to uh, bring some of the other indexes in as well uh, as a plot comparison so you can see what kind of spreads are out there. But for now, you can see the BRTI, which is the real-time intraday index, and the BRR, which is the reference rate that gets set every morning, as well as the futures. And coming up soon, we'll plot the future and the spot on top of um, on top of each other in the same chart, Ed, and that's going to go across uh, the commodity spectrum. But uh, as far as volatility, we recently looked at something um, we did – 60 minute bars over the course of seven days and we took uh, 24 of them to 
to uh, figure out the volatility. So we took 60 minute bars, took 24, figured out the annualized volatility. And we did that from uh, 1213 to 1220. And we got volatilities that ranged anywhere from 50% all the way up to 225%. So in in those sections uh, of time, you know, we're seeing, and, and as Mark mentioned, with some of the some of the movement numbers, you know, we're seeing uh, just some some kind of normal uh, historical annual volatility as well as some really high abnormal volatility. So it will it will I think continue to be that way as for what you know, if nothing else, the futures have sort of tamped down the aggression of the move up, but. Uh, um, you know, I think people, I think there's a mixed audience out there. I think there's people who want to see the thing get hammered and, and break pretty hard. And obviously there's people who, you know, somebody told me today when I was talking to them, they said, well, when the parking attendant starts talking about Bitcoin, then he knew that it was time to get out. So, I mean, that's really where we are when, uh, grandmas are asking grandsons, uh, in the market about what's going on with a particular type of commodity, then we know that there's uh, there's uh, potential problems on the horizon. But for me, it's uh, you know it's another thing of interest. We have some numbers. I know there's some questions out there about when the other products are going to come uh, around it. You know, options, ETFs, that kind of thing. I think those things are in the near term. I don't know how near term, but um, Outside of that, also tweeted, you know, the other good thing that you want to see on something like this is anybody wants to see on any product, right? We've had a, we've had a steady volume increase, or, or we have a good volume this week in particular, but we had a pretty steady volume and increasing volume all week on the futures. Got a good distribution. I think we got a little bit more in the calendars um, or in the in the serials and quarterlies outside of the front month on both exchanges. I think we're see, we saw a little bit more acceptance uh, in the CME products and uh, starting to see some spread trading as well. So all those are going to, um, you know, play into the continued interest in it. And obviously, you know, this is a way for people to trade it without having to be uh, along the physical quote unquote coin. So increased volume, increased open interest. See the fund contracts got 400 open already, 400 open interest. There's almost a hundred open in the, in the quarterly March as well. So that's all good. Um, good stuff. Fun to watch continue to uh expect the thing to whip around quite a bit and i don't know if i don't know what anybody expected uh, i i expected it to be whipping around and uh, the fun part about it i think more than anything else was you know it sort of drags down the rest of the coins too so i think you're going to see you're going to see you're going to see this one get hit the other ones get pulled down and then people are going to see the the opportunity to get to get back into those different coins like iota or ripple or litecoin uh or even ethereum and then you'll see the you'll see it kind of get perked up because people are going to look for opportunities to get in where they thought they might have missed the boat yeah you know that was of course the big question with the launch of these uh, these derivatives contracts was you know a lot of people thought the run-up in price of bitcoin was due to the fact that these various fragmented quote unquote exchanges out there, a lot of them had limits on how much you could actually sell at any given time. So those bids there weren't really bids for size. So that's going to effectively help drive the thing up if you can't sell the damn thing uh, in any sort of appreciable size. And so people thought, well, now that you come these futures, the CME one in particular is a size contract. People are going to start hitting the bids. We're going to see this massive sell off in uh, Bitcoin as a result. And we saw a little bit of a sell off, but then it kind of reverted. And this Sunday we saw new highs. So it didn't really materialize and then of course this week happens some people are going to be looking there'll be a lot of navel gazing and looking at the tea leaves as to what exactly drove this sell-off and who knows maybe the futures uh, were part of it in terms of people finally being able to get some size off in this thing who've been waiting for a while to probably dump some of this why they waited a week who knows maybe they wanted to see if this thing took off or maybe there were probably some other uh, fund under un easy for me to say other fundamental factors that were driving this and then the futures played their part either tamping or exacerbating it depending on which way you're looking and so there'll be a lot of an analysis i think uh, going forward of uh, of all this kind of stuff but interesting and certainly uh, a lot of big numbers going up today which is interesting across the board pretty much whether whatever venue you're looking at uh, big volume 
So which is that was the one big question. You know, would people, would people really embrace these things and flock to them, particularly in times of crisis? And it seems like so far, at least, that indeed has been the case. Any other thoughts here, Mr. Nick? I know we have a bunch of listener questions about, so we're probably not done with Bitcoin yet. But for now, what anything else you want to add here on the big Bitcoin frenzy here of, of this week? Yeah, I think the other thing to keep in mind, too, is uh, some stuff I've been hearing uh, with my contacts out there in the Bitcoin world is, you know, look for a repo market to get established at some point as well, or people already talking about it. So that's going to enable people to borrow the actual coins that then they could actually sell to really short, right? So right now, you know, you don't know whether these buyers are shorting and, and trying to cover or or vice versa, right? So whether it's covered you know, basically a covered play or whatever the case may be, but there you're, you're going to hear near term a repo market for the coins. So people will be able to people who have a lot of coins who bought early, who don't want to get rid of them, but want to make some money on them. You're going to see them lend them out to people at a pretty good rate. And then there's going to be real actual shorting of the market. And I think that's when we, we get things to be really interesting. Right. And I think that's when we're going to see the sustained movement move down. When we see a big move down and then a stay down, that's when we're going to realize that there's actual people out there that have borrowed coin to sell them. So there's a real physical play on the market because, you know, the reality is there's 21 million coins out there, right. Or 21 potential coins out there. Um, I think it's near 16 or something that's actually been mined. You can check coin market cap for the exact number. But we also have to keep in mind that of that 21 million, how many were lost either by people's machines breaking down than not having their key? I heard I read a story about somebody who built a supercomputer to try to hack his password because he forgot his password for his uh, cryptocurrency. So, you know, as much as that market has an established size, I think it's smaller than that is. And then when you start to hear, when you when when somebody low level like me actually hears about people trying to get into a repo market that will allow people to actually short the market, I think we're, we're still in for a lot of interesting uh, roller coaster movement in the price. Yeah, I think uh, I think roller coaster movement is pretty much the one thing we can safely bet on in, in the old coin here for the coming months. And you're right, you know, there's so many things, so many shoes left to drop there. The repo, of course, everyone's asking about the options. We'll ask you guys about that in a little bit. In fact, spoiler alert, we already did. <laughs> so I'm looking at some of the numbers right now. But still, it's been uh, it's been fascinating to watch, and uh, I'm 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 hoping get the options soon so we could really sink our teeth into that in the meantime people have also been sinking their teeth into all things crude let's get, let's, let's get a little crude here on the old show mr nick if you are so inclined of course i'm talking about all things uh, wti a lot of you guys have this on your trading radar these days uh, it's been another up week at least to end the week uh, most of the major i was like across the board you got about up about a half a handle to about a handle across the term structure there so right around the 58 level or so uh, out here in WTI land. And yet again, it doesn't seem, every week, Nick, I feel like a broken record now, but every week it, it seems like, oh, you know, they can't they can't crush this vol anymore out here in WTI. And then every week they do. Do you feel like me? Like, like It's almost like how much more can they crush this and they do it again? Are you starting to feel like me that it's just like a, it's just like an endless beating out here? Well, I mean, I hadn't looked. I was in New York a couple of days uh, um this week and I, I wasn't in front of my computer so much, but they, they beat the daylights out of the volatility. So am I surprised? I, I mean, we talk about it all the time. We get a continued pattern or a sideways pattern in, in a market and a price it's, it's gonna, it's gonna get hit from a vol standpoint, but I mean, this is really bad here. Um, I, I mean, you're talking a one and a half percent on the front contract with 26 days left. And, and, uh, uncle Mike and I were talking about that last week, how, you know, you usually see us, in, in, in another commodity, you see stuff come in as you go towards expiration, you're going to get a bump in vol because the vol over the weekend or something is going to make up for the decay, but you're not seeing it here. Um, yeah, so am I surprised? I'm not surprised. What is that? Sorry, not sorry. I'm surprised, but not surprised, but it's 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 getting hammered pretty good. And when you look at the uh, the 20, the, the amount of movement on, a, on 26 days left on a 15 and a quarter uh, volatility is only about two and a half bucks in either direction. So we've seen that. That's easy. Do I think I think oil? You can pay the rent with the oil right now, as we like to say. 
Uh oh, the rent is back. You can pay the rent with the oil. Well, it's it's, it's so freaking cheap. At a certain point, it's just like, wow, how can you sell this anymore? It's getting crazy. And of course, historically, it could still go lower. We all know that it can get into single digits. Uh, but still, it's just uh, it, it is. At a certain point, you have to start saying to yourself, my goodness, they really are are crushing this. As Mr. Nick would say, it does seem like it may be time to perhaps pay some rent in the old... Uh, cause certainly, the contract's moving. You're, not, you're not, not getting your bang for the buck there. So it's been, uh, it's been a fascinating one to watch. They just continue to squeeze the life bullet out of it. OIB, which is the, the VIX of WT, I believe they're around a 17 or so now, which, you know, the lowest it ever got in, in the heyday of crude about a year, year and a half ago. The downside, the floor was about probably at 35, so 2x that. So this thing has really just been, they've been squeezing every last bit of juice out there. So if you are a premium buyer, a lot of you have been writing in saying, when is the worm going to turn in crude? You know, you get enough movement out there now, and it's so cheap that you don't really need to have a huge vol explosion. Certainly would be nice, but you could you could usually probably aggressively scalp this and at the very least, as Nick would say, pay the rent, if not do a little bit better out there on this. Let's see what's been lighting it up out here this week. Overall, a, a decent week, but not a rock'em, sock'em robots week, up a little over 4% in terms of net OI out here in good old crude oil. And where the action was, number one with a bullet this uh, this month, listeners, Came in Feb, actually. It was the Feb contract, about 40, 41% of the paper going up out there. And if you're saying to yourself, well, this week where where WTI settled out around 58, where was the action? Was the 58 strike? Nope, a little bit north of that. It was the 60 strike, number one with the bullet, about 11,000 contracts and change lighting it up this week. The lion's share come in yesterday, about 3,500, then about 3,000 on Wednesday. The rest scattered pretty equally uh, throughout the week. And of that, a lot of back and forth, only about net, net 600 opening on the week. So a lot of back and forth. People were looking at that at that 60 track. We're going to break it. We're going to stay north of it. What are we going to do? And uh, we're settling out on 58. People uh, doing a lot of back and forth trading on that strike, as, uh, as you might expect. Number two right behind it, came the uh, double puts, a 55 puts also in Feb with about 9,800 of those. The lion's share coming uh, yesterday and today, actually exactly equal, 2,517 both days, up oh, briefly eclipsed by Monday, 2,375. That was the big day of the week. But yesterday and today, equal numbers, which is kind of interesting. And about 1,500 that opening, so a little bit more opening bias on the double puts. Then we actually got to jump out a little bit to March, to the March 58 calls, almost the exact same number, 9,800 and change going up on these 58 calls here with uh, the lion's share coming Thursday, almost 7,000 of the nearly 10,000 going up on Thursday. So that was where the action was. Uh, and about, of that, about 4,100 or so opening on the week. The rest of the week kind of anemic uh, from a volume perspective. Then we get back into the Feb. And looking at uh, right hot on its heels were the aforementioned 58s, the at the money strike, uh, 8,300 of those lighting it up this week. The lion's share coming again on Monday, 2,700 and 2,200 on Thursday. Uh, the rest kind of broken up throughout the week, about 1,200 opening there. And uh, 57 puts also pretty active this week as well, 8,100 there, about 20, about Monday. Yeah, Monday was at about 2,500 and about 1,600 opening there. So an interesting smattering of uh, activity across that Feb and March uh, looking here, Nick, actually kind of, a, we, we've been lamenting for a while, uh, the weeklies not getting a lot of action, but it seems like, uh, this, uh, what is this, uh, week four here in the Dece actually looking pretty decent, getting about 58 and a half calls doing 1500 contracts. So that's a pretty active week out here in the weeklies, even the 57 puts in the week five doing about nearly 600. So not, not a bad week for the weeklies, maybe Maybe some of that narrative finally starting to turn around that the weeklies, for whatever reason, uh, can't get the love. If you're looking a little bit farther out, a little bit more, uh, shall we say, optimistic strikes, you got to go all the way out to October of 2018, where the 75 calls were lighting it up to the tune of a 5,000 lot coming on Monday. That's it. 5,000, bam, all opening on Monday. So uh, someone establishing for size fairly optimistically out there in Ock. If that's not far enough out for your blood, you can go out to Dece 2018 as well, where we saw 7,600 
of uh, the 75 strike, also lighting it up, kind of kind of evenly trading throughout the week. Half of them on Mon- excuse me, on Wednesday, about 1,800 on Thursday, about 1,000 today, and the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. So the 75s in Deese, pretty active contract, and about half of that, 3,300, uh, was opening this week. And if you're more concerned with the downside, uh, well, then what do we got for you here? We got oh, all the way out to Deese 2019, someone... Uh, trading a thousand of these 35 puts, Deese 2019 35 puts, uh, 500 yesterday, 400 Tuesday, 100 on Monday, and a good chunk of that opening. So an interesting kind of smattering throughout the week, Mr. Nick. And we talked about the vol already, but if you have any other thoughts there about there about that or about the skew, as well as maybe a little bit of a resurgence in the weeklies here for WTI, have at it, sir. Yeah, I think. You have to continue to talk about the vol just just from a standpoint of, well, like if you look at the, well, the weekly's got seven days left. Those got hammered even more so, which you would sort of expect, but not even in, that's what we were talking about last week. Not even an uptick in vol with the, with the contracts that are sort of like we talk about the term structure tends to loop up as you move towards expiration for that stuff under under two weeks or, or 10 days, you know, the vol start, at least in the euro dollars, the vol always sort of kicked up and, and just sort of said, we're going to, you know, we like that price. We like where it is. We're going to, we're going to make up some of the decay, but you're not seeing any of the decay getting made up here. But um, I just think the extent of the extent of the term structure and, and how much of all is down across the board. I mean, it was, you know, I guess you can call it, if you don't include the weeklies, almost a parallel shift down in the volatility and, and and that's you know and when you and I talk about volatility being down, typically we're 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 more engaged with the first three, four, five months. But this time, this week, we see the whole curve come in, the whole term structure, and all the way out to June. That's out. That's all the way. I'm sorry, July, August, Sep. All the way, a whole year is out at least of all. But you have almost a vol and a half across the whole term structure. So, so that's, that's more significant to me than the fact that the front contracts down and not really taking any of the decay out of it with an increase in volatility. The fact that they basically pounded down the term structure and for, for the June contract to be under 20 and the March contract, which has 60 days to be almost under 17. So, I mean, that's significant to me as well, as far as the skew, you're not really, you're not seeing a big change. Uh, the calls are still cheap. You're not seeing them get much cheaper um, or or less cheap. So they're kind of steady on the week. The puts got less expensive, and I think that's just an overall result of the just the vol in general getting sucked out of the out of the out of each curve and out of the term structure itself. The stuff that's going to have a higher vol is going to see more of a depression in their numbers as well. So. We saw the we saw the puts come in, but that's just a function of just the overall vol coming in. So they're going to tend to hit the higher strikes if they can. So that's what's really um, catching my eye here more than anything else. I mean, last week I'm sure you listened back to the show. Uh, we talked about a lot of high strikes trading further out in the curve, and we're seeing those same high strikes at least in a couple of the months trading again. So there's a little bit of optimism from that standpoint. But you know, when you start seeing uh, and again, I'm a year into watching the, the crude, but can look at the historicals and see how it moves. I mean, you, you still there and, and given the ranges that we have and the possibilities of some movement, when you're just talking about a two and a half bucks one way or another, you would expect that you, you probably could do that just with a little bit of pessimistic or optimistic new uh, news one way or another. So I go back to what I talk about all the time in gold, you know, here we might see the case where some hedged upside or some hedged downside will uh, will pay for itself rather quickly. So a 25 or 30 delta hedge call or put, and you should be able to see uh, getting that premium back in your pocket after uh, a little bit of a move in the opposite direction, depending on you know what you're looking at the call, the call you're going to go down, the put you want to go up, and then if you do get a, a continued move one way or another, you're going to be uh, long that option again. That is fairly inexpensive. So yeah, it's it's tough. Again, here though, right? You can. It could always go lower. We talk about it, uh, and maybe a lot of it's got to do with the fact. And, and this is something we mentioned last week as well. Uh, you know, this week was running in the Christmas. Um, 
you also had the end of Hanukkah last week. So you had holiday and upon, upon holiday. And then you get uh, Christmas on Monday, Boxing Day on the 26th out in the UK. And then you're running back into a holiday and exchange holiday on the second, I think. And then so you really have a lot of time where people may not be paying attention or they're taking a little break at the end of the year. So maybe maybe this is the right thing that Vol is depressed so much. Yeah, you know, it's 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 it seems crazy on one hand, but yet on the other hand, you, you never know. You know, we we are in this weird environment, and people certainly are not reticent to hit some bids when it comes to vol. So we shall see how this plays out. But I'm definitely on your tip there, Mister Nick. That I think uh, I think you can pay the rent with some of this. Speaking of paying the rent, I think we got time for one more product here before we get to some of the uh, some of the listeners coming at us in droves, Mister Nick. So I'll let you. In the spirit of the holidays and giving, I'll let you make our final selection. What do you feel like in your bones you want to talk about? What was really catching your eye this week, sir? Well, uh, catching my eye might be the wrong term, but I, I always, I, I just, I have, I have to look at the gold just because we need to talk about it. How I did I you know you were going to say that? It's like I have it up on my screen in front of me here already or something. Amazing. You do. You know why? Because the Vol got hammered last week, Okay. Um, the vol's in again this week. We had a we had a decent move up too from our lows. We had 21, 22 bucks that were up. So, as much as as much as you say, okay, we're back in back in the range. If you did anything down below in terms of gamma related options down there, you you got your money back, uh, pretty almost certainly. So. Um, you know, again, we won't even pay attention to the jam so much. That's four days. We're gonna, it's gonna run away from us by the time we even get back from the holiday. But the 34-day option is in a vol, and it's trading at almost, it's a little over seven three-quarter vol. So, um, with a, with a, and and again, we we talk about it. We moved higher back in, not higher through any sort of resistance, but back into the middle of a range. But like we always talk about. Vol is gamma, gamma is vol. It just depends on how high the vol is, whether we say vol or whether we say gamma. So there was opportunity just in that range this week with a $22 move. So, um, you know, you got to pay attention. And, and this is still, this is sort of the bottom third of the range. So it still has uh, some room on the upside to move uh, into the 1300 range where that's kind of been the re- near term high. But uh, that's what catches my eye there is the, the fact that you can go out to June and you have uh, June just over is the first contract over a 10, a 10 ball. Um, but uh, you're getting a 90 day contract, nine and a quarter, 34 day contract, seven and three quarters. Um, you saw the calls get a lot cheaper this week when we look at the quick skew at least well a lot cheaper in the in the in the feb and the march so that they came in, they got cheaper and the puts got a little bit more expensive again as you would expect we sort of move along that like we move along the term structure we move along the vol curve as well so we have a pretty um even smile so based on the smile if we look at the uh the march contract which is a 60 days we have uh the puts and the calls are about the same uh, uh, amount rich to the at the money. So maybe we're looking at about the 1275, 1280 is sort of our balance point. So if we, if we do, and, and if, and if we look at our range, we, you know, 1250 to 1300 has been about what we've been doing with some dips below 1250, you know, down to the 1240s and stuff like that. And a, a little bit of a run up past 1300, but we're sort of in that belly of the vol curve. And, and I think, um, you know, just moving along, moving along between those two numbers we just mentioned that there's some maybe some opportunity just to to still to be in there from a scalping standpoint or to be short there outside of that range from a strangle standpoint so that's what's catching my eye there really more than anything else sir you're just a degenerate premium buyer out there you know i am i I wish there was a premium (laughs) and not premium buyers anonymous (laughs) then i would probably go well, you know, it's hard to argue with you at these levels. It's just, I mean, they keep squeezing the juice out of it. And it's, it, it's, it's at a certain point, you have to say to yourself, this is this, this way lies madness. There's something I could do with this uh, to pay the rent. As we mentioned, we're talking all things gold. Uh, good week for the gold bugs and netting, finishing up about 20 handles right around the 1275 level, as Nick already alluded to the vol, taking it on the chin again this week. Uh, we've been saying for a while now, at least a month, that gold has been hovering right around the bottom of those of those five-year volatility cones, 
and uh, yet it continues to be there. So uh, if you think you can take one of Nick's hedge strategies or scalp aggressively or play around a little bit, if you can do stuff, as one of my co-hosts on my other show says, uh, you could probably make it worth your while out here in gold. Let's see what was lighting it up out here this week. It was front month, indeed front week. Mr. Nick, the 1260 puts out here in Jan. Uh, we're lighting it up to the tune of, actually, before we even get to that, net on the week, it was about up about 3% from a gold OI standpoint. So a decent week, but not a, uh, not a home run uh, by any means. Again, what was lighting it up that front month, indeed, pretty much a weekly now, uh, 1260 puts going up 5,000 times, about half, about about Wednesday and Thursday, both leading the charge, about 1,400 and change on both of those days. The rest of the week kind of uh, scattered and mixed. Net only 500 contracts opening, so uh, that 1260 put strike was clearly where a lot of back and forth action was uh, throughout the course of this week. Then we see, actually, we got to move out a little bit out here to these are the Feb 12 half puts. That uh, were number two with 4,800 and change of those, lighting it up about almost 2,000, about 1,900 going up on Wednesday. That was number one with a bullet out there. And again, a lot of back and forth trading out here with only about 500 contracts net opening on the week. So kind of was a bit of a, a back and forth week out here uh, in all things crude. And speaking of uh, back and forth, now we got to jump back. To the Jan again, that's where number three was. They were all very close, all around the 4,800 or so level. 4,770 of the 1,280 calls, which is right pretty darn close to where we netted out. We netted out at 1,275. The 1,280 calls doing about 4,800. Uh, the lion's share coming on Tuesday, 1,500 of those there. 1,300 today, so pretty active out there in the 1,280s today. Net actually closing on that strike, about 1,300. Uh, so people taking, taking some action off the table there. Uh, on these uh, on these on these calls, and we draw down twelve sixty five. So people playing right around the at the money at twelve seventy five. The twelve sixty fives uh, doing about forty two hundred. The lion's share coming on Monday actually sixteen nearly seventeen hundred going up there, and a net closing out there as well about seven hundred uh, closing net on the week. And as we like to do with gold, we always like to look a little bit farther afield as well, see if any weird paper came across our radar. Nick, we're still looking for uh, something to equal that crazy gold trade. I got a feeling when we do our end of year recap, look back next week, Nick, that somehow that gold trade is going to figure in there. Spoiler alert uh, for, for next week's episode. But looking ahead a little bit in terms of outliers, didn't see too much uh, in the uh, quote-unquote super crazy town realm here, uh, Mr. Nick. We got the nine half puts lighting it up out here in August. Oh, not many times, about uh, about 351 times. 975 puts lighting it up out here in July about 300 times as well. Maybe a little bit of a calendar going up out there uh, between those two months. On the extreme upside this this week, our winner here is the uh, are the... <laughs> These are the June 2019 1775 calls going up 626 times uh, this week. Actually still trading today, doing 500 yesterday and 126 uh, today. A total, again, 626. And now that yesterday paper, at least, uh, was opening. Worth noting that the 1800s and the 1900s also trading this week. 200 of the 1800s and a buck 50 of the 1900s. Pretty much all of that opening. So someone's opening for a wee bit up here, Mr. Nick in these uh in this contract out here this was what well, this is this is june of 2019 so some weird paper and that's not weird enough we're gonna round it out with 25 of the d's 2019 2000s nice round number mr nick but uh aside from that craziness anything else catching your eye out here as we uh, as we finish up with gold mr nick no the other thing uh that we have to continue to mention here is even though and it's always to me a good sign in general even though we're in this, this depressed state of volatility with uh, just even mentioning the fact that the, the Jan contract traded down below 5% today, you know, it, it's just insane, even though it's just a four day contract. Um, we have to keep in mind, we have to mention that uh, we're still seeing increased open interest. You're up another 30,000 in uh, the, in the, in the overall gold totals, we're almost approaching a million in open interest. So that's been the general positive note I think we can take from all of this in the crude and the gold. Let's just look at the silver in honor of Uncle Mike. That open interest is up as well. So 
even in this low vol environment, people are still trading, still opening positions, which bodes well for the fact that maybe it goes back to what we talk about in terms of people just can't believe that the vol is this low and they continue to want to get into the market. So at some point, uh, it's going to pay off. It's just a matter of how long it's going to be. But increased open interest in a low volatility environment, always a good sign for um, the market itself, for the exchange, obviously, because they like to see that, but just for the people trading in general, because it makes them, it, it at least gives them some liquidity and a, an opportunity to do something. Yeah, and before we move off here to get some of your questions, I know we were talking a lot of Bitcoin at the top of the show, but believe it or not, there are other underlyings that were rocking and rolling and moving and shaking this week. So let's do our quick uh, big gainers and losers here uh, for the week, the rockers and rollers. Uh, Bitcoin aside here on the old CME platform, this is just pure underlying, no vol, no uh, open interest changes, nothing like that. Uh, on the upside, we got good old Arbob up a little over 5% this week, platinum number two. 4% copper, but up about 3.5%. Heating oil up about 3.25%. And rounding out the top five, we got lumber up 2.5%. On the downside, we got feeder cattle off nearly 4.7%. We got uh, oats off 4.3%. The euro dollars, our old friends, off about 3.5%. Uh, the peso, peso dollar off 3%. This week, and uh, what's this? The ultra, I think this is the ultra treasury there, about uh, ultra T bill, two and a half percent off to the downside, followed by soybean meal. So, a little bottom six there for you. Meanwhile, though, let's keep on rolling. You guys got questions? We're gonna try to answer them. It is time for some of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options. Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, StockTwits.com slash Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider radio network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. It's time for you guys to take your place here on the old Twifo show. Questions, comments, all sorts of craziness. The, the, he just told you how to hit us up. So uh, hopefully you have no shortage of ways to do just that. Carrier pigeon a little bit slower. But we'll take those as well. We got a bunch here, Mr. Nicholas. Just a lot of them. People got Bitcoin on the brain still, so we'll start off with some of those. Uh, this comes from Tiny Spec. And he's just writing, uh, it says, Donald Trump might be long. Bitcoin? Question mark, exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point. And, you know, I wasn't that familiar with this uh, conspiracy theory, Mr. Nick. Uh, it was first floated to me earlier this week on one of our option block shows. So I think one of our listeners was asking about, hey, do you ever heard about this rumor uh, that, and then uh, maybe he's commenting on that there. But yeah, apparently there's this rumor floating around out there, Mr. Nick, that uh, that Trump's along a lot of Bitcoin, and that's why he hasn't uh, mentioned it at all in any of his things. Are you are you wearing your tinfoil hat today, Mr. Nick? What do you think about this? Oh, well, the, I, I, the older I get, the more the more prone I am to believe these conspiracy theory type stories. But um, I don't know. You know what I've done, and and maybe this is. I've, I'm, I'm paying attention to what's going on in our political environment, but I'm, I've stopped following Trump and all his relatives because I was just getting ticked off. So does he own it? It wouldn't surprise me, but at the same time, I don't know if he's that smart. I know Eric's definitely not that smart. I can tell you that much, uh, the young son, but I'll, that's as far as I'll go. So, uh, he's going to benefit from this tax bill more than he will from the Bitcoin. So whether he's long or not, I don't really care. There you go. We'll we'll stray out of the political realm there, but uh, it just seemed uh, it seemed kind of funny. Uh, more Bitcoin. Your buddy Mark Brandt here, Mr. Nick, asking: Should uh, WTI be priced in the Bitcoin value of of GC? I'm not sure what GC. He's got he's got acronym soup here. GC to strip out the dollar risk 
Uh, that's <laughs> I think I think you can make an argument for anything these days to be priced uh, in Bitcoin. We're probably going to see some of that pretty soon uh, in a lot of these. I was talking to someone the other day on one of our shows looking to sell some land for Bitcoin. Uh, these So everything is, is coming up Bitcoin denominated these days. Um, he also says he can't wait to see the commitment of trader reports on the Bitcoin commercial shorts. He thinks it's going to be a lot of banks. Uh, that will be interesting. You're right. And I'll, I am looking forward uh, to seeing a bunch of that. Now that we have a little bit more data, a little bit more insight, and like, for example, this week, who was hitting the bid on these things? That will be very fascinating uh, to see out here. Uh, what do we got here? Ez, Ez Espresso. I like that handle. Uh, saying, um, good. He's, oh, he's, he, got a, he sends us a link from uh, CME research on this. He says, good, this is a good piece on the gold versus Bitcoin from CME, and uh, he sent us the link. An interesting article. I actually took a look at this. is from our buddies, of course, Blue and Eric uh, Nick, who've been on the show many times. Uh, they, surprise, surprise, did a little research into Bitcoin, comparing it to uh, gold. This article, I believe, is from about a month ago and changed, so the, the numbers are a little dated, uh, but still pretty interesting. We'll have to bring Nick or, or Blue back on, not Nick, we'll have to bring uh, Eric or Blue back on to talk about this, maybe with some updated numbers, because it is kind of fascinating. Uh, they talk about kind of uh, Bitcoin as a store of value versus the currency and, and how it shakes up there. Uh, they say since 1971, gold's uh, uh, 35, appreciated from $35 an ounce to $1,300, so that's a gain of 3,500%. Uh, they, they, at the time they did their analysis, the Bitcoin was 5,300. So. <laughs> This article a little bit dated now. It's it's a little bit more than that, but at their analysis, it had already appreciated six million percent in seven years. So not a bad return. Uh, what else they're saying? The annualized standardized deviation of gold again from the time this article was written was twelve percent. Uh, had a seventy percent drawdown compared to to Bitcoin. That looks pretty sleepy. Uh, we see 60%, according to Blue and Eric, 60% annualized standard deviation over the past 12 months. Uh, and we've seen uh, 175% annualized risk, according to them. Uh, it's already had, brief, had drawdowns in its brief lifespan of 93% and 84%. Uh, he says other markets have taken drubbings, like crude, for example, it's off 67% from its highs. But still, it's, uh, that's a different beast you don't see crude the same way as like a store of value like you do like like a Bitcoin or, or gold. Uh, let's say also an interesting point in this article too, Nick, uh, then I'll get let you chime in with your thoughts. They say Bitcoin has kind of a very finite supply and we kind of know when it's going to be tapped out and how many there will be. Whereas uh, go and, and, the, and at the current prices, uh, the, uh, oh, the most Bitcoins there ever will be will be 21 million. And uh, at that value, the value of the time they did the paper, it's obviously much more now. It was about $120 billion for the aggregate present value of all Bitcoin, uh, whereas that's pretty much eclipsed by the amount of gold that's mined just every year uh, out there. So a lot of interesting comparisons. If you wanted to see uh, Bitcoin versus another you know, precious item, a currency store of value, call it what you will out there and see how they compare and contrast, this is a great piece. We're going to have to have Blue or Eric on with some updated numbers to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Nick, any thoughts here? On this article that was sent, to, what was the guy's name again? Sent in to us by Ez Espresso. Yeah, no, I like Eric and Blue's stuff, and in particular Eric's stuff, uh, especially around the new the new Bitcoin uh, articles that he's been writing. You know, a couple things just in general there, right? You know, we talked earlier about the twenty one um, million available coins, right? But let's not forget that that those that the coins can spawn other coins, right? So the Bitcoin spawn, spawned Bitcoin Cash, and that that already had its own run-up. So you know, as much as much kind of inherent value that they might have, there are ways for them to sort of you know, kind of have children, and the pyramid of value then has to be taken into account. So I'd I'd be curious to ask Eric what he thinks about that, right? Because you know that if at some point, there's going to be another fork where they spawn off something else with the Bitcoin or the cash is the Bitcoin cash is going to split. You can't take that out of the realm of, you know, what the value of that store has been. You know, as as far as going back to Mark Brandt, and I, I actually want to meet him someday because he just looks like he's uh, he looks he looks like he's crazy. He looks like he'd be fun. So that's just based off the Twitter stuff that he profiles. So. Uh, that's just a guess on my part. But anyway, Mark, if you're out there and you're around, shoot me up and we'll grab something, grab a drink or something to eat. The other thing, um, 
the other thing uh, of interest is the, the question that Mark had about uh, valuing another commodity in Bitcoin. I just I just don't see how you can do it. I don't know about you, Mark, but I wouldn't put I couldn't put anything in Bitcoin value because the whole point of being able of, of something in barter, even back in the days when uh, when the Native Americans were using corn or other things to buy and sell things. There, there was value. There was some sort of inherent value there. And I don't think Bitcoin has anything consistent enough that, that I would say, like if, if they started charging Bitcoin at the, at the gas pump, why, if I thought it was Bitcoin was going to up, why would I ever want to get rid of it? The whole point of spending dollars is I know that my dollars have some value and there's some steadiness to that value. So I don't see doing it anytime soon. And even these other currencies like Ripple, who's, who's, who, who's, Ripple's been ripping higher, you know, from 24 uh, a month and a half ago, it traded up over a dollar recently. It's going to be used transactionally, but at some point there's got to be some sort of consistent value because otherwise you're not going to know what to charge in terms of uh, absolute number or, or what you're willing to spend. So I don't know how you feel about that. I mean, the fact that I can, I know that I have that gold has some steady value i'm willing to potentially make a trade with that because i know i'm not going to be regretting it whether i'm the buyer or the seller of the item yeah you know i was saying the same thing to this person i was talking to yesterday on one of our shows who says he wants to sell some land for bitcoin i said how is that how would that process even work look at a day like today the value is so so turbulent you have to say sign the paper now no sign it now because every second you you it, the price of that land is going to dramatically change uh, just based on a few seconds. So, yeah, it would be hard to use that in a, in a real currency uh, perspective, at least until this near-term volatility dies down a little bit, because you're right. You go to the pump in the morning, you go to the pump in the afternoon, you're buying your gas with Bitcoin, you just paid 30% more or 30% less. Uh, that, that is kind of hard to, to have that be a reliable form of exchange when it's that volatile. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, let's jump off Bitcoin for a second. We'll probably talk Bitcoin all day. Oh, here's some love for you, Mr. Nick, from Bilk. Good old Bilk. <laughs> Saying, uh, <coughs> excuse me, good job on the show, Nick. Mark left the show in good hands. He can take vacations more often. All right, just to clarify, I was not on vacation. I was deathly ill. Uh, so I was not off in the, in, in the sun drinking margaritas. But uh, that said, yeah, I agree with you. Nick did an awesome job, so I'll have to put him in the hosting chair more. I'll have to bump you up to the adult table more often, Mr. Nick. What do you think there? Bilk sounds like he likes it. Well, it's like, well, I don't look at it at the, uh, I look at it. Do you, you see that commercial that's out recently? The old guy sitting at the old people's table and he wants to go down to the kids' table because it's more fun. That's how I look at it. I look at it as going. <laughs> there you go. So you're on the fun table. going the other direction. I'm, I'm in the boring, stodgy table over here and you're in the fun, uh, the fun kids' table laughing it up with uh, Uncle Mike and Matt Bradbart and Blue and Eric and all the other uh, all the other crazies we have on the show here. Uh, here's here's let's wrap up with a couple more here. We got um, here's one that's up your alley, Nick. You can probably speak to this. This comes from LV67. He or she wants to know why the heck is futures and uh, futures options data? I believe that's what they're talking about there. Why is it so hard to get? Uh, you're you're this is your business. <laughs> so uh, what are, what are your thoughts there for uh, this person who's uh, who's lamenting how hard it is to do your job, Mr. Nick? Well, first off, I I would say why not reach out to me and I will try to help you get what you need uh, because we have access or available 10 years of pretty solid data uh, in all the benchmark uh, futures options products. So if you need anything, reach out and I'll be glad to help. Secondly, I think it's getting better. Uh, I believe that it's, again, you know, you can... You can you can almost say that exchanges in general think of their market data as almost Bitcoin, right? Because it's so precious that they don't necessarily want to give it away for what everybody else seems to think is a reasonable price. So it's difficult because it's not been made easily accessible. Um, it's difficult because it's so expensive, and it's difficult because a lot of times when you get it from different places, it's not consistently good. It, it's probably more consistently bad. So um, it shouldn't be hard. I can I can definitely I have I've, I've gained a lot of experience over the years in terms of where it is and what you can get depending on what it is that you want. Um, but I'm glad to help. So we're here. 
we're going to be doing some project work and releasing some project work, making uh, futures options market data more available, more easily available, uh, and reasonably uh, priced. So feel, stay tuned first and or reach out because uh, that's part of what the exchange and QuickStrike are trying to do um, moving forward. All right. Uh, good point there. Yeah. N Nick and his team were kind of doing that for you there. What was the name? Not Espresso. It was, uh, I forget the handle, but um, Bilk. <laughs> uh, no, no. LB67. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nick and his team were kind of doing that for you. So if it's hard to get, hit them up or just sign up for Quick Strike. And a lot of that work is done for you. That music means we're done as well, listeners. Uh, let's wrap it up here with a little quick uh, love. We've got some love here coming in. A lot of love this week. Must be the holidays, Nick. Love coming in on the, ch on the live chat here from Option Guy. I like the handle. Option God saying, uh, awesome show. Thanks for so much insight. You should charge. Don't give me any ideas there, Mr. Option God. But I appreciate the love. We, Nick and I do work hard to bring you this fun show every week uh, for the low, low price of nothing. So uh, check it out. If you like what you hear, though. Head on over and kick the tires on Quick Strike. That's what we ask you to do. If you like it, check out the free version. And then you head on over to Bantix, B A N T I X.com, to see the big boy version over there at the big boy table, which is all full of all sorts of cool stuff. Like what, Mr. Nick? What can they get if they head on over to Bantix? And you guys are always working on cool stuff, even in this holiday season. If they wanted to go check out the tools and maybe try on the big boy version, what can they look forward to? Well, yeah, I think it's always a good idea to take a look at the big boy version. But like I always do every time we talk is to say, check out the free one first to see whether you think the, the more advanced will suit you even more so. Um, what good stuff's coming down the pike? Well, I mentioned that uh, the new uh, Bitcoin pricing information is out there on the CME Group website on the cmegroup.com slash quick strike page down near the bottom in single asset market products. Um, you'll be able to find that tool, and that tool will be getting better as we uh, do releases at the end of the year. Um, stay tuned for some really good stuff coming uh, coming down the pike from QuickStrike. We have new calculators coming out, new spread builders coming out, so really simple, easy, smart building uh, tools that will let you, you know, click on strikes, and it'll t it'll know what you're trying to trying to build based on common strategies out in the market and give you a price in Greeks right away and let you look at that expected return or theoretical value chart or even the historical price action of that spread itself. So really those are when you want to get engaged. Um, those tools are going to make it really easy for you. And we're going to be doing some, some, you know, we're always working to try to make the layout more useful and easy for everybody. So we're working right now and on, on more consolidation and just better utilization and probably going to have a new pricing restructure after the new year as well to try to make it as, as available and affordable to everybody as possible. So stay tuned and listen. We'll give you more details as they become set in stone on our side. There you go. Check it out, listeners, bandticks.com. And of course, while you're listening to this show, if you want to follow along with reports, Head on over to cmegroup.com slash twifo. That'll give you all the reports. Make sure you adjust the date for whenever you're listening. Speaking of dates, we will be back with you again next Friday. We are not quite, you're not done with us yet for 2017. We got one more show coming at you. We're going to be looking back at all the craziness that happened here in 2017 in the futures options market. I'll give Nick some homework to prepare some stuff. So it should be fun. So stay tuned for that. And we'll, of course, see you one more time in 2017 for more Twifo. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by QuickStrike, options pricing and analysis software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. 
That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.